very cleverly calling it Kerry Packer's walk, because it was, because Kerry Packer, for younger audiences don't know, Kerry Packer took on the establishment, took on the Poms, took on everybody, the Australian cricket establishment and everybody, and said, okay, it's war, and I'm going to beat you. And he changed cricket forever. I mean, we wouldn't have the one day as now, we wouldn't have anything like this. You know, and when I started doing my prep for it and doing the research, you know, one, I mean, everybody knows the legend of Packer. One thing that is an absolute sacrosanct fact about Kerry Packer is that no matter what business deal he was involved in, he would never bet the farm. He would never, when he was gambling, he would never bet more than he could afford to lose. That was his whole MO. So he could afford $60 million in Vegas. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Drop $60 million at, at a Vegas casino because, you know, he's got another $60 million at the ATM if he needs that. But with World Series cr- cricket, he bet everything. Mm. So had it not succeeded... Consolidated Press would have been wiped out. Packer would have been wiped out. Channel 9 would have been wiped out. He bet the entire farm on World Series cricket. And I had tremendous trouble getting my head around why he would break his own golden rule for this. So that was the first thing that I had to... I had to unlock that and figure that out. Why did he do this? And then the other thing, because, you know, I had to stack on all this bloody weight again to play the big fat bastard. (laughs) You know, I wish somebody had offered me an Olympic swimmer's role because I could get into shape. Um... You know that Harry's favourite food, the favourite thing that he loved the most in the world was McDonald's quarter pounders with cheese. He'd have two or three a day. And Fanta. He would drink Fanta by the litre because he never drank alcohol. No. People so, say he looked like a boozer, but he wasn't. No, he wasn't. Never. In fact, no. I didn't know that till I started no, researching because no. I was thinking, oh, I'm looking forward to those cool scenes where I've got the scotch in my hand and I'm being, you know, like uh-uh. Don Draper from Mad Men except like fat and bald. But anyway, so Fanta was his thing or freshly squeezed orange juice as he used to refer to it. So I thought, hang on, you've got this guy who eats like a 12-year-old boy at a birthday party. And then I started looking at his behaviour. And I go, he acts like a 12-year-old. Mm. And then I started looking at his youth. And the most re- reading and research I did was actually about his formative years as a young boy. He was a desperately lonely kid. Well, his father, Frank, taught, treated him was, like crap. It was a, abs- he, was a ch- he was abused as a mm. child. I mean, his father, he, if Kerry had done something wrong, Sir Frank would scream at him for half an hour and send him to his room. So mm. Kerry would sit in his room having a sook to himself. Then Frank would come in with a riding crop and beat him for 15 minutes. But give it a good half hour for Kerry to calm down and think the trouble was over. It was torture. It was brutality. And as a grown man, Frank would humiliate Kerry. Oh, he, called him, he called him buffhead in front yeah, of all his he staff. Called, and... He called him my idiot son, mm. you know, because Kerry had dyslexia. And so, you know, he was humiliated and bullied most of his life. And so ultimately what I figured out was this is that what How's That is, it's the story of a lonely little rich kid with no mates who formed a secret club with a secret he password, mm. and that club was World Series Cricket. And the friendships that he formed out of that were the friends that stayed with him for the rest of his That's life. That's why Tony Gregg stayed on his payroll yeah. forever and ever. Richie Benner. Mm. You know, these guys, the, the Chapel brothers, Marsh, Lily, all of them, all of the West Indian players, all of them, saw Kerry as an equal. He saw them as equal. They were his true closest confidants as a result of this. So if you're that lonely kid who suddenly got friends for the first time in your life and the bad guys come knocking, the British establishment say, no, no, we're breaking the party up, and the Australian authorities say, no, you're not allowed to do that, then you bet the farm. Hmm. Then you bet the farm. You become the gunslinger who's going to do everything to protect your new friends. And that's, that's what the story is about. Is Kerry Packer, I, um, one of my Packer stories, really hard me to host midday. I had to go to his house and oh, yes. I think I already had the job. But uh, Kerry, I had to see Kerry and uh, he walks, I hadn't seen him about 20 years, and he walks in his own den and says, uh, G'day, son, long time no see. And I finally get the job. And uh, as I'm leaving, because it's unusual, I'm a current affairs guy, uh, not, not as nice as Ray Martin suddenly taking over. <laughs> And as I walked out the door, I, did, I didn't want to say. Go on. As I walked out, I said, "I said, well, just trying to, I thought nice way to exit." I said, "Well, KP, I said, I'll surprise you." And that look, that pack of look came on his face, and he said, "Don't ever surprise me." He said, "I don't like ever surprises." And I said, "Okay," and and left, and that was it. Yep. He but, could. Yeah, and you, you've taken it. I mean, some of the tempers tantrums are, are, are amazing. Boy, a couple of those you you recreate, recreate in the in the yeah. boardroom. That's scary. They were um, there. A couple of massive tirades. I mean, in part one, and there's a few even bigger ones in part two. But it was interesting that day. And people, if they choose to tune in on Sunday night, will see one of them. That was actually one of the most pleasurable experiences for me as an actor on a film set that day because. Oh, vocally, you can't you can't just do take after take after take mm. and that kind of stuff. I mean, it's a massive, full volume, absolute assault on a room full of guys. Verbal assault, and so 
you know, when you're making a film, invariably you'll do a take and then the cinematographer will say, oh, well, you know, well, let's tweak this, tweak that, and they'll spend another half an hour faffing around. And then you go do another take and they'll tweak a bit. And I, you know, I, I've been around the game long enough to know how all that happens. And I said, look, I'm not going to do any of that. I'm going to do two takes of this. And I said, we will rehearse for an hour for camera. And so what we did with the entire cast and crew working so brilliantly together, we rehearsed the scene, but this is how loud I did the shouting. You do this, you do that. Yeah. I whispered it. So we rehearsed for an hour with me whispering it. So we blocked everything. We had three cameras on me, a couple on dollies, and uh, good to go. Bang. And Knocked loaded. it out in two takes, one medium, one close, See, and that's it. Jackie Weaver taught me that trick. What's we, that? We were recording um, You're the Voice, John Farnham's mm-hmm. uh, thing, and of course, I thought my voice is never going to rasp me anyway, and yeah. I'm, I'm in this huge, fighting, screaming scene at her, and she said, don't say anything. And so I never spoke a word. I, I mouthed it all. Yeah. I just whispered to myself and mouthed it all, you, and all that sort of mm-hmm. stuff, and uh, saves your voice. Himself. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It? Save it for when you need it, you know what I mean? Now, you come a long way since I knew you as a teenage, gawky yes. teenage kid in my house. Yes. Walked in my house one day, uh, p- very proud of yourself, in a <laughs> c- Hawaiian shirt. Which, by the way, I went to buy one for you the other day from the same place that I got that shirt, <laughs> okay. which is that the, used to be the Greville Street Bazaar, right. right? And I went to, the, it's now the Chapel Street Bazaar, so I went in there on Tuesday, however, I thought, I'm going to get this bastard. <laughs> so I went in to find a wine shirt for you they didn't have anything as gaudy or monstrous as what i was wearing that day when i would have been about 14 you were and you strode into my house you <laughs> looked like you thought you looked like christmas and you said look at this you know he said two dollars that cost me i looked at you and i said boy did they see you coming <laughs> <laughs> you turned away after saying that and you just shrugged you and who ripped him off and yeah. walked away <laughs> hey i'm going to tell you something about those days though because i i was talking about with dylan your One wonderful stepson, stepson yeah. and best mate with Dylan about this not long ago, one because Dills and I would come over after school. You know, Jack had inv- Jackie would invariably be home from rehearsals. She would burn some sausages in that electric fry pan that she'd always have set up in the kitchen for us. Whack them on a plate with some mashed potato, and there'd be our dinner. And Dylan and I would always whack on VHS tapes of comedy shows, whether it be a stand-up mm-hmm. thing like Steve Martin or Lenny Henry we were watching one time. And you were at seven at the time, and you came home with this tape, and you, you walked into the TV room, and you said, here you go, guys, check that out. And it was the first tape of the D-Generation's news show for Channel 7, which had not gone to air yet. So Dills and I whacked it in, and we thought it was the funniest thing we'd ever seen. And this was this became Fast Forward? Yeah. Well, no, no, no. The this run? became the, oh, the, the d which right. became Late Show. That's right. And Dills and I were just obsessed with the D-Generation guys. And I remember saying when we were at drama class at school, I said, I'm going to work with those guys one day that you introduced me to by showing me on VHS. Well, of course, years later, I've now worked with every single member of the D-Gen I did because they split off and became That's Working true. Dog and, and I've then, done and, 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 and then, of course, in, in, in Beaconsfield, you had the visor. I did a very, very good uh, Richard yeah. Carlton. Oh, he was pretty good, wasn't he? Mm. Spooky. You know, I was talking with Steve about that because they were into cutting, at one point in the rough cut, actual footage of Richard Carlton with footage of Vizard, and I couldn't tell the difference. Yeah, no, he did a good job. 